Hi there. This is Elise from the True Crime Cat Lawyer. I host this podcast with my sassy sidekick, Winston the Cat. For our first 50 episodes, we brought you bi-weekly episodes covering the serial killers, missing persons, and unsolved cases in our hometown area of the Pacific Northwest. Our mission is to create ethical true crime content, putting the victims and their families first. We're coming back with a brand new format for our podcast. Starting in October 2022, we'll be bringing you seasons instead of bi-weekly episodes. Our first season kicks off at the Pacific Northwest True Crime Fest on October 8th and 9th. After that, we'll bring you nine more weekly episodes every Friday through December. We have a really interesting lineup of episodes and we hope you'll join us for season one. You can find True Crime Cat Lawyer wherever you're listening to this podcast. Hello, everybody. This is Megan. And this is Alana. And welcome to Tea Time Crimes. velvety smooth today and you're looking yes, great i, I understand am. that this is an audio podcast but you look amazing oh sorry there are viewers can't see us <laughs> <laughs> yeah i usually uh, let's just set the scene here i'm usually running back after i've woken up and walked the dogs and fed all the animals so i'm like a a slovenly disheveled mm. person with no makeup on normally and now I have makeup on and I even have like a nice sweater. So Megan's really, she's really getting the show today. I mean, you look, you have a natural beauty that exudes from you at all oh, times. A natural beauty. But today you look like, you, why are you dressed up? Or are you going somewhere? No, um, we <laughs> took Christmas photos. I could tell by actually. your face it was ridiculous and it was so good. <laughs> you took Christmas, so you and Chris took Christmas photos. Yeah. With all, like, the chickens and the yeah, dogs? I mean, I'm not going to spoil it too much for you, but okay. we had somebody take our picture this oh time my because... Gosh. You had professional we, photos? Then? Well, it's a friend, but she's also professional. Does she get paid to take photos? I don't know if Chris is paying her or not. That's, well, I'm unclear on that. Do other people pay her? Yeah. So you had professional photos done? I, I, I guess, yeah. And there's different scenes. There's an outfit change in everyone. Oh like, I can't gosh. wait for you to get it. Yeah. For such a Grinch, I'm a little surprised. No, no, no. Go. I love Christmas. I love the holidays. I love getting cozy. I love a fireplace. But it starts December and ends December because you can't spoil the magic. Well, it's. I guess you're a little bit early. Obviously, we were off last week. Sorry about that. Yes, we're back we're almost now. there. We're almost to the first. We're two days away. I don't I think know. So. Count. One day. Was Rupert in any of the photos? Oh fuck. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> he must- <laughs> so like you were so, like you'd left a child out of the family <laughs> photos. You said that like oh, you forgot no. your stepson he, from the photo. He might have been at the foot of one of the pictures, but I don't think he's gonna make the cut. Oh my god. I think she's gonna crop it. Maybe somebody could Photoshop him in. This is devastating. Yeah, it is devastating. Do you have a new plant behind you? It's really distracting. No. That, That's that plant, new. That plant's always been there. No, it hasn't. I swear to God. It's always been there. There's a, Something's different. I'm turned a little bit. Okay. I'm, do we have the same sweater on from Stitch Fix? But yeah, we do. Colors? We do. They... They stop it. They, Stitch we Fix do. does not pay us, by the way. But no, Stitch should. Fix gets us the exact same. But bo- we also have that other shirt. They get us the same exact boxes all the time because we're the same person, <laughs> fashion wise. Which is not it's that. That's yeah, not a brag. To, when we used to work together, they would just think we're the same. We did. We don't look alike. Is the point? No, we don't. <laughs> okay. Do you have a tea for us today? I. Do I say that like sometimes you don't? Have you ever come with that one? (laughs) Oh shit! (laughs) I knew I forgot. (laughs) I thought I was just supposed to look pretty today. (laughs) 
yeah, that's my. I can only focus on one thing. Let's be honest. You would you um, would show up you you would show up looking good for an audio podcast. <laughs> you know me. I got the <laughs> what, what what was our I was used to uh, yeah when you fa- did spam. I said, oh, you've got such a face for radio. So yeah. I, used to, I used to leave that note on your desk every every time you went off oh, to the spam. Our notes were so fun. Yeah, she oh, did a spam contest days. with her dad, which I thought was Pam, dorky. Radio. What am I calling it? Spam. Yeah. <laughs> spam. <laughs> Amateur radio contest. She did a pot roast microphone contest with her dad. <laughs> anyway, she would go off all, all weekend, and I thought it was so funny. Mm-hmm. So I always used to we used to leave mean notes to each other, and that was mine. Okay. This is a specialty because it comes from original special. Oh no, hold on. <laughs> original special listener daughter. Wait, she sent you one too? Yeah, I'm I- the T. Time. <laughs> You're the crime. What do you think's happening here? She sent me one and I thought, well, because she's my family. So I thought, oh, I'll have to send a lot of one bag, but it's um, mine. She said, love ya to me. When she signed the card, so I think you have a competition. I'm just going to take your family over. (laughs) Hi. That's fine. My dad's already accepted that. Uh, Okay. So, yes. Thank you to that uh, special listener. Junior. Junior. Uh, The original special listener is the one who sent the Tea Time Crime cookies that we featured that were unbelievable. I still tell Chris, I wish I had a Tea Time Crime cookie. (laughs) (laughs) They're so cute. And she introduced us to Kolkata Chai, which was the yes, original th- which two is, thrusting thumbs. That's how you started thrusting and yeah. upsetting me. Yes. I mean, once you once you drink something like that, you don't stop thrusting. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> um, today <laughs> we have a pumpkin spice. See how it's just in time? Because, I mean, after November, we might have to cut off the pumpkins. Well, you said after October, you we're cutting it off, and I said to get over it. No. I encourage it from September to November. Oh, okay. I'll have to go back and listen to the audio. (laughs) It seems worth it. Pumpkin spice rooibos. Is that how you say it? I was wondering how you pronounce it. So I always said rubios because I put the I in the wrong place. But now that I stared at it many times, it's rooibos. It's not roy, though. It's roo. It's roy. It's R, it's R O O I B O S. Roy boys, boy boys. <laughs> okay, you got just a mouth of marbles every time. This one has a pumpkin on it, and it's not an apple. And it's a pumpkin that's shaped like a teapot, and it's very cute. It is cute. I want one of those in real life. It Can reminds me it of me? Cinderella when it does her pumpkin yes. turned into a stagecoach. Would you rather your pumpkin turn into a stagecoach or a teapot i mean a teapot i have a vehicle yeah that's true you know and you don't have a horse to carry it. yeah i mean what am i gonna do to sit there unless she's gonna bring <laughs> in some mice or there's a photo shoot okay moving on this pumpkin beverage is warm and beverage. inviting evoking nostalgic memories of autumn with mm-hmm. every sip Ooh. A carefully selected blend of rooibos <laughs> is combined with natural pumpkin flavor, cinnamon, nutmeg, <laughs> and clove. You can't even say cinnamon now. <laughs> a naturally aromatic, wonderfully flavorful beverage, delicately packed in a pyramid seat sachet. What? Sachet? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. You said none of those words right. I I did. I just put a flare on him. No, it's not Satchit. <laughs> yes, it is. No, it's not. <laughs> What's it called? Satchit. I don't think so. What is it called? Sachet? I think so, yeah. No Let's way. Look. I think so, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Satchit. You're a Satchit. <laughs> I'm looking it up. Um, As she's looking it up. I'm a little nervous. I know I say this every time. <laughs> Shocker. <but, laughs> I love pumpkin spice, but rooibos has a unique flavor. So it's a... Continue. We are looking oh, God. To pronounce <laughs> For reference, this is a word of French origin. Oh, In fuck. French, you're going to be right. It is said as sachet. I'm sorry, what was that's that? That's French. No, no, that's French. As is usual in French. In English, however, this is normally said as... Sachet. 
Oh, what's that? Oh. <laughs> Sachet. Okay, I have an issue with that because I got my hatchet and I got my sachet. Let's go. <laughs> we roll out at dawn. Why did he say however in English and then say it the same way? I need to teach him about his no, teaching he's, skills. There was more of a flair, as you will, for I'm going to have to put this in our sources now. We've played this man's voice. <laughs> there was more of a flair. He was like, sure, sure before and then he says sachet <laughs> like i do and nobody i'll tell you what was never said was sachet <laughs> so it's not said one time sachet oh right. it's so good anyway you were going right. on a tangent about pumpkins continue <laughs> i love i love pumpkin spice Ro- rooibos which is like a, a broom like bush <laughs> um mainly found in south africa it it's a unique flavor Chris would describe it as tobacco water. So mm, that um, sounds delicious. We'll see how this tastes. Uh, we're gonna do a smell first. It smells like pumpkin juice. Yum. Nothing like smoking a cigarette and pumpkin juice and having a big old <laughs> jug of it in my satchet. <laughs> okay, I'm going for it. I just keep hearing sachet over and over. It's my favorite word now. So this tea glides. Oh. It glides. It sachets into your mouth, perhaps? Yes. From its pumpkin carriage, it glides in and it takes up every corner of your mouth. And it like coats it. Sounds mildly disturbing. The pumpkin flavor is a little bit there at the beginning. It's slightly artificial, but it really settles into the rooibos aftertaste which i don't think it tastes like tobacco water it definitely is unique and the only way i can describe it is that it tastes like the color of sand red sand so that's all i can do (laughs) but it doesn't taste like sand it tastes like the color of it so yeah do what you will with that you are killing me today oh that's a third sip can i get a rating i like it this is this is a perfect accompaniment for a fall day. And we're going back to our rating, which we've used thrice, a gloved thumbs up because mm. it should be drink and drink and drink, drink, <laughs> <laughs> drink, drink. I'm saying drinking or drinking. Neither. And then I should say drink. Drinking yeah. with my sachet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So it, it should be drunk and that doesn't feel right. Oh, my God. You should drink it in cold weather oh, with gloves on. Wow. I don't know. Maybe it's Maybelline or maybe we got into something else. We crazy today. <laughs> it's because we're recording later than usual and I have makeup on. So that's what's really. Yeah, we're all out of sorts. Making it nuts. Okay. So a gloved thumbs up. You didn't want to yep. use a uh, special listeners rating that she provided. Oh, that was a really good one. What did she say? A basic bitch is thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's not basic bitch because of the rooibos. Otherwise, it would be. Oh, That really obviously. makes it a little bit more. Yeah, you can't have you something know, in a sachet to call it basic. I'll tell you that right no. now. <laughs> okay, this is 14 minutes of chaos. Are you ready to get into the story? Yeah, we're back. Okay, here we go. We are talking today about Bertha Gifford. Bertha. So Bertha Gifford was a Midwestern farmer's wife known by her neighbors as the Good Samaritan. She took care of dozens of people in the communities that she lived in for decades. But and before she died, it was believed that she could have killed nearly 20 people as she sat by their side. Oh boy, Jolly Jane. So Bertha is remembered as a serial killer, but you know I love to dive in and look at everything from all angles. Bertha's great-granddaughter, S.K. Murphy, wrote a book, The Tainted Legacy of Bertha Gifford, and she retells the history of the case and offers just an incredibly unique perspective. I also read a a lot of other things, you know, about Bertha Gifford, but I paired it with this woman's story, and it's really interesting. Cool. So the author admits in the book that she didn't know much about her great-grandmother because her own mother felt so ashamed at having yeah. this as part of her family history. Hush, that she hush. didn't know about it until she was an adult and way way into her 30s because she didn't want to be judged for her grandmother's actions, which, 
which in itself is such an interesting perspective that we don't really think about a lot, that we always think about the victims being obviously the people that were mm-hmm. hurt or murdered. But then the actual serial killer has family members who have to right. live with right. this shame and guilt. And yeah, that's terrible as well. People judging them because of another person's actions. Right. It's, right. Yeah. Let's get wow. into Bertha. So she was born Bertha Alice Williams in 1874 in Morse Mill, Missouri. Her parents, Missouri. Matilda Lee and William Poindexter. Whoa. You know, were married on New Year's Day of 1859, and they how were said to be. How do you res- pick that? What? How do you pick that day? My guess is you're pregnant. Oh, yep. I mean, maybe wait till the second. Well, I, I mean, it's also well. E- I guess it easy might be for nice anniversaries. to have. Yeah, you're right, and it, it's nice to have the day off. Yeah, that's true. Some people, yeah, they don't have a lot of PTO. No. Anyway, they get married. They're a respected church going couple. They had ten children together. Nope. Oof. Two of them died as infants, so they had eight surviving children. Wow. By the time Bertha was an adult, she was only five feet, two inches tall, blue eyes, auburn hair, said to be quite attractive. It's you. I'm way taller than that. Mm. I have brown hair, not auburn. Yes, Auburn's I have blue like eyeballs. Brown. No, it's not. It's a, it's a reddish brown. At the age of 22, she marries Henry Graham, and they have a daughter together. So starting out, Bertha and Henry, her first husband, they run a boarding house together. And apparently Morse Mill was kind of this getaway, which I wasn't expecting. It was a getaway from the city. And people from all over the world would travel there. And celebrities like Charlie Chaplin, Al Capone, Charles Lindbergh. And they would stay. It was like a little bit of a resort town. No, that's bizarre. And they would stay at the Morse Mill Hotel where Bertha was said to have worked. And now it's said to be completely haunted. I don't know. <gasps> side, side note for when you want to go to the I don't want to go there. Right. I figured. So Midwestern farm life, you know, has its own set of issues. And rumor sure. has it that Henry is unfaithful to Bertha. Uh-oh. Not pleased with this, Bertha allows her interest in another man, Eugene Gifford, to play out a little bit. Probably a little bit more than she would have had she mm-hmm. not found out that her husband was cheating on her or had cheated on her. And so Eugene, or Jean, as everybody called him, had moved to Morse Mill at the age of 20, and Bertha is married, and she's a, at least 10 years older than him, but it's assumed that the two started an affair. Oh, boy. Henry, her husband, does not like, you know, this taste of his own medicine, and he gets pretty upset. They start fighting <laughs> about Jean, as you would imagine, mm-hmm. and by some twist of fate, Henry falls ill with pneumonia and dies a few months later. Wow. Cause of death is listed as pneumonia. Bertha buries him, collects the life insurance, and then her and Jean get married. Yeah, but how do you cause pneumonia? I think the the uh, hmm. autopsy wasn't done well. I don't think they did an autopsy. Hmm. So the newly married couple moved to a nearby town, Catawissa. I think I'm saying that right, but could be another statute. My guess would be to evade some of the rumors that were swirling around about them, probably particularly aimed at Bertha, even though both yeah. Bertha and Jean were in an affair. You know how that falls down. Yeah, it doesn't of course. bode well for the woman or an older Mm-mm. woman at that, Mm-mm. right? So they moved to this super small town. It's got a post office, a church, and, you know, two stores. That's about it. It's mm. full of horse and buggies when they first moved there. And even as the automobile becomes available – it's not something that kind of takes on real quick in this part of the country, in this small city. A lot of people are still using horses up into the 40s. Okay, wow. Even though cars, they're a car here and there, a truck here it's and there. It's a small city, though. Yeah. So Gene's making his living as a farmer. He is leasing out farms and he's raising corn. No, not raising corn. He's growing corn, <laughs> raising hogs, had cows, mules, you know, you know what farmers do. He's also making moonshine. Oh. Yeah, Get it, That's where the money is. He was described as easygoing, even tempered, easy to like. Everybody seemed to really like him. And Bertha had her daughter from the previous marriage. And then Jean and Bertha had a son together that they named James after okay. Jean's own brother. So Bertha's well known in the community because everybody likes Jean. She's also known as an excellent baker, especially her biscuits, which I know sounds ridiculous, but I mean, a good biscuit is a good biscuit. 
Biscuits are amazing. I know. I was they're just not, talking about them. Not everybody they're, can make a good biscuit. So Bertha's no. got it. And she's known, like I mentioned, as the Good Samaritan because she goes above and beyond to care for members of the community as they fall ill. She'd ride really far. She'd walk really far. She'd stay up all night. And she's one of the first people that her neighbors or others in the community would call on. Now, later it would come out that Bertha seemed to have a fascination with death and accidents Mm. and morbid things, but I'm literally hosting a true crime podcast right now, so I don't feel like I can judge on that piece. Mm. She just seemed to talk about that kind of stuff a lot. Bertha has no education past elementary school, probably fifth grade, certainly no medical training, but If you remember from Jolly Jane, that's kind of common. It's not uncommon for those times. They didn't even start regulating nursing. You weren't even required to have a license till 1921. Jeez. And school didn't even start until the late 1800s. It didn't even become an option. So if you're in a rural area, you get help where you can. So they have a doctor, right, who is in charge of all these towns that are connected. But the, the doctor makes a house call and then he goes. There's nobody to take care of, you you know, there's no nurses. Yeah. There's nobody to watch you overnight, to administer your meds, to get you food, to sit with you. There's nobody to do that. So Bertha would step in and did that for tons of people in the community. So the one doctor, Dr. Hemker, he was the one who was seeing all of these patients and then Bertha would swing in and he'd give her the medicine and she would administer it. Wow. Eventually she just became known for this and would, she first started wearing a white apron and then some people say she just started wearing a nurse's uniform. Because okay. she, she was just, just like evolved. stepping into the role. So that's fine, right? She's helping out. Mm-hmm. And she's doing this for a long time, for years. But in 1927, May 15th actually, a man named Edward Brindley arrives to the Gifford house and he's drunk. Mm-mm. Ed was a known alcoholic. He also worked for Jean as a farmhand from time to time. So it's not unusual that he would stop by, but he's there and he actually fell down and hit his head outside. So Jean brings him in, sets him up, gets him a bed, and then Bertha takes care of him. She calls the doctor. The doctor sees him. She takes care of him. The next day, she gives him a ham sandwich and a glass of lemonade, and he dies. (gasps) Now, at this point, members of the community and Dr. Hemker have heard rumors So Dr. Hemker actually consulted another doctor in the nearest town to see what he thought the cause of death was for Ed, but no autopsy was actually performed. Hmm. Well, I have a suspicion that this has been Marianne Cotton jolly jane So six months after Ed's death, the prosecuting attorney, Frank Jenny, starts an investigation into into this death particularly because he thinks there are others. Bertha and Jean are furious, and they threaten to sue anybody who says anything bad about them. Oh, boy. So they have a grand jury, but there's not enough evidence to go on because they didn't do autopsies. I I don't understand that. I know. But Frank Jenny, the prosecuting attorney, won't let this go. So he starts to gather more evidence, and he brings in pharmacy books that were signed by Bertha, and he starts getting notes uh, from people, letters from people who Bertha had taking care of their family members. And it's at this point that Jean and Bertha want to move to get away from it because it's kind of spiraling out of control. And so they move to Eureka, Missouri. I have a question. Yes. Do you know what language Eureka is? <laughs> how, how would I know that? No, I don't. I don't either. But I want to know because it means like I've got it. Eureka, I've got it. But I'm, I was just thinking <laughs> no, like what this. is... What is the what is the root language? Anyways, uh, yeah, continue. I'm definitely if they had if they had known that this case would have been cracked wide open. Probably. So as Frank Jenny is compiling this evidence and still pursuing this, God, people must be pissed as they're sending all these letters. Like, like they're taking action. It's thought that. Bertha was possibly responsible for up to 17 deaths. Yikes. So who are these possibilities? Well, if we go back all the way to the early 1900s, in 1911, Jean's mother, Emily, came to stay with Bertha and her son, Mm -hmm. along with Jean's brother, James, who was 13 at the time. He's young. Okay. In 1913, Emily falls ill, vomiting, stomach pains, and she dies a few days later. She killed her own mom? Her mother-in-law. Oh, well. I mean, also, like, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh. I mean, that that's, it's, it's less, 
crazy. Like killing your own mom is intense. Um, okay. But All right. also All right. don't kill mother in laws. Mothers in law? Mother in law. I don't know. Mothers in law. Yeah. And maybe just don't kill. Blanket statement. Yeah. In 1914, too. the following year, James, who was 13 at the time of his death, not when he moved in, Aww. dies from similar symptoms to his mother. Bertha nursed both of them through their illness. That's cruel. In 1915, her neighbor, who's a, who was a baby, 15-month-old no. Bernard Stolfelder, had pneumonia. Bertha stayed up all night with him, three nights, three days. He did not survive. No. 1917, a man named Sherman Pounds arrived to sleep one off and was dead the next morning. 1917, 52-year-old Jim Olg, or Olgi, he was a farmhand to the Giffords, and there was a little bit of dispute about his earnings. He fell oh, ill. God. Bertha no, swooped in to care for him immediately after swinging by the local pharmacy to buy some rat poison, a.k.a. arsenic, and then Jim died three days later. Why are people continually going to their her care if people are dying? 1921. It's a great question. Margaret Dolfelder, Bernard's sister, also came down with pneumonia. She's two. Dr. Hemker gives her medicine. Bertha sits with her. Three days later, Margaret dies. Hmm. 1922, a young girl named Beulah Pound was left in Bertha's care just while her mother went to run an errand for babysitting. When the mother returned, Beulah was very sick. Bertha sat up with her. Her mother was worried, called the doctor, and Beulah was dead before the doctor arrived. Wow. Is the doctor not getting all this? Come on. No postmortems were done on any of these people, and it's said that one of Beulah's aunts suggested that one should be done because Beulah was related to Sherman, the man from above. They were relatives in some way, and this woman, so this woman knew both of them and thought it was weird, and Bertha got really mad and really angry. What the heck is wrong with her? Morbid. So 1923, seven-year-old Irene Dolfelder, so Margaret and Bernard's sister, becomes ill with a stomach bug. Doctor sees her. She starts getting better. Bertha shows up. She dies Mm-mm. shortly after. Bertha also cared for this ch- these children's grandmother, who was getting sick from the stomach bug. She was on the mend after a week. Bertha swooped in to help her. She died a couple days later. There's a trend here. Yeah. 1925, Mary Elizabeth Brindley, a letter was sent in to the prosecuting attorney saying that this little girl was recovering from surgery, and Bertha sat up with her the whole time. At one point, a member of the family came in to check on her, and they saw Bertha quickly (gasps) slip something back into her pocket, (gasps) and the little girl died shortly after. Now, in 1925, this one is where people started to wonder. Their neighbor, the Jean and Bertha's neighbor, the Chamels, Ethel and George, were married. Ethel became ill, and she died. Two months later, Ethel's son, Lloyd, who was only nine years old, became ill, and his father, George brought him to Bertha to care for him. He died in Bertha's home. Hmm. Weeks later, his seven-year-old son, Elmer, also got ill. George brought him to Bertha to care for him. He died. George Shamel's sister, Leona, who was 37, also got ill. Bertha went to care for her. She died. So Dr. Uh, Hemker is the one signing all of these death certificates. Right. Like, why is he not think, picking up, like, I don't know. There's, somebody needs to notice something. Yeah. They, eventually they do. Yeah. So people, rumors really start after the two boys die. Mm-hmm. Rumors really start, and they start calling it the house of mystery, and the rumors start going around town about Bertha at this point. The cause of death that he's putting on, Dr. Hemker's putting on all of these death certificates is the same. It's the same thing that Marianne Cotton's people had. It's that acute gastritis or the yeah. gastroenteritis. It's just the stomach condition. Now, in 1926, Gene, I told you, is a moonshiner, and he has a still. And he got into a fight with his friend over property or over this moonshine business, his friend Gus. And they had a little falling out. It said that him and Bertha actually got into a fight, and Bertha may or may not have threatened him with a butcher's knife. I don't know. (laughs) But Gus's mother, Grandma Bertie Interstall, became sick, and she died under Bertha's care a few days later. So then you get to May 15, 1927, to Ed. So Ed is the one that tipped the scales. Yeah. Right? So on August 23rd, 1928, Bertha is officially charged with first-degree murder on one count for Edward Brindley. 
Well, there's a little bit more behind that. And there are several reasons why there's only one, because there's not really, there's no evidence really. What what do they have to prove it? Just It's just a lot of people dying under Bertha's care. However, a lot of people also got better under Bertha's care. So you uh. have these terrible mortality rates. It's not uncommon for people to die from an illness like the flu or pneumonia or things like that. So there's no way to no. really prove it. How is she picking who lives and dies? I don't That's know. I want to know. Also, Ed's family seems to be the loudest. Okay. And it's the most recent, so the prosecuting attorney thinks, well, if I'm able to exhume the body, I have the best chance of finding evidence. So he starts with Ed. Now, at this time of Bertha's arrest, Bertha's granddaughter, who is the author's mother, right, that I told you about earlier, Mm -hmm. Bertha's granddaughter is living with Bertha because her mother works in a boarding home and it's got some shady characters because of you know, prohibition and all that stuff going on. So she shipped her daughter to Bertha's to be taken care of by her grandmother on the farm, like live this beautiful childhood on the farm. So Bertha's granddaughter described her as attentive, super loving, very kind, and she was loving life at the farm. Huh. She went when she was just 10 years old, and she's there the day that Bertha gets arrested. So it's August 1928, the police show up. Chief McDonald arrests Bertha, but he doesn't really say that he's arresting her. It's believed by the granddaughter that she didn't know that she was going to be arrested because she stopped and she went and put on her hat and she put on some rouge. She wanted to look her best because she was going down to the station to make a statement. Whoa. Yeah. Now, she describes her grandmother as loving and kind, but through the course of this investigation for the book... The author found out that when Bertha's granddaughter, Ernestine is her name, was 10 years old and she was coming to stay with her, there wasn't a really good school in the area. Okay. Okay. And so Bertha went to the school board and she asked them to make repairs on the current one. The school board denied the request. So Bertha said that she burned the school to the ground so that they'd have to build a new one for her granddaughter. Oh, My gosh. Now, the author, right? So this is she's talking to her mother about this, so her own great-grandmother would have done this. The author thinks, is that? Surely that can't be right. But she did find an article in the paper about the schoolhouse burning down, and nobody knows how it burned to the ground. But a new one was built, and it was ready to go. I guess it was effective. When (laughs) Ernestine arrived. Anyway, so Chief McDonald has Bertha down at the station. Again, what's the motive? There's no physical evidence. They're collecting statements from people in the community at this point. Some of them are still saying she's fantastic. She's a she's a good Samaritan. She's helped us through so many hard times. She sat up with me all night long. No, I'm sorry. And no. then other people are saying, no, something weird is going on. She's Everybody. poisoning a lot of people. The chief leaves her in a room for the whole day, kind of unattended, not talking to her, letting her sweat it out. He finally goes back in and it's accomplished what I think he set out for it to accomplish, which is Bertha's eager to talk to somebody. So she says to the chief that, yes, there are rumors going around, but they're not true. I never hurt that little girl, meaning Beulah, because those are the most recent. So they're talking about Beulah, the two boys, the brothers, and then Ed. And But she says, but I did give Ed and the Shamo brothers arsenic, and it was to slow their heart rate down. And I do the same for myself. I take it for myself. This is what she's saying. She's saying she takes a little bit of arsenic to mm-hmm. slow her heart rate down. Yeah, but she gave them too much. She's telling the chief this as if they're having a conversation. The chief publishes this in the newspaper the next day, and Bertha is beside herself. So it gets published in the Republican Tribune on August 28, 1928. And I want you to listen to – I'm going to read parts of it. I want you to listen to it thinking of both sides, thinking of what if this is a woman like Jolly Jane, mm-hmm. and what if this is an uneducated – woman who grew up on a farm who thinks that arsenic is some sort of home remedy because she takes it herself, okay? So the statement starts with, I, Bertha Gifford, and then she states where she lives and that Mr. Shamel had brought his sons, Elmer and Lloyd, and that she had cared for them. It continues with, and this is a quote from the paper, Lloyd was sick at the time. Dr. Hemker waited on him and left some medicine for him. I put some arsenic in the medicine before I gave it to him, and Lloyd died on or about August 11th, 1925. About September 18th, 1925, Elmer John Shamel took sick. Dr. Hemker was called and left some medicine for him. 
and I put some arsenic in it, and Elmer John died about September 22nd. About May 15, 1927, Edward Brindley, about 48 years old, drove up to our house in an old Ford. He was drunk. He came in, sat down for a little while, then got up and went out and fell down on the concrete. My husband went out and brought him in, and I fixed the bed for him in the front room, and my husband laid him on the bed. His mother came over and insisted we call a doctor, so I called Dr. Hemker. He left some medicine for him, and I put some arsenic in the medicine. In all three cases, the patients were suffering from severe pain in the stomach, and I put arsenic in the medicine to quiet their pains. Oh, boy. So that last line, to quiet their pains, the press picked it up and ran with it Got because it. it sounds so devious. Yeah, it does. But if you think, is there a possibility of, she's like, they're hurting, it, it, and I gave it to them like you would give somebody Tylenol. No, not at this point because of a, how many other people have died. But they don't know that yet, necessarily. They're wondering. They're trying to piece this that. together. So, the, like I said, the confession is printed. She denies the entire statement, says it was a lie. There's some question about it, too, because she doesn't talk like that. So there was probably a little nudging from Chief oh. McDonnell, like the I, Bertha Gifford. Like, did she really say that? I don't know. So Gene insists that Bertha is innocent. He loves his wife. He stands by her. He gets a very good defense attorney, James Booth, and she enters a plea of not guilty. By September 1928, Edward, Lloyd, and Elmer are all exhumed, and significant amounts of arsenic are found in all three bodies. Oof. Enough that Dr. Hemker gets a little bit of heat from the Missouri Health Commissioner for this. How Good. did he not notice? How yeah. did he sign all these death certificates? Exactly. Like, he needs to be thinking, like, oh, like, either there's a pandemic happening or there's something weird. Dr. Hemker admitted that he used arsenic as well for well, medicine. He did and, back in the day. Yeah, and he but, used it. Oh, no, hold on. He used it enough. He was suspicious enough that in these three cases, he did not administer arsenic in case a postmortem would have to be done. Whoa. Yeah. Like, maybe say something else other than just let's wait and see. <sighs> so the trial starts November 19th, 1928. Bertha has been in jail for months. Jean goes down every day to visit her. He is the only person who she really will speak to other than one sheriff who is in charge of her is in charge of her jail. As she was first jailed, she went on a hunger strike. She couldn't eat. She didn't eat for five days. She lost a ton Jeez. of weight. She only drink water. And then finally, Jean would coax her and bring her things that she would eat. I don't think I could do a hunger strike, to be honest. Oh, God, no. If anybody talked to her besides the sheriff who was in charge of her cell or Jean, she would hide under a blanket. At at night she would pace her sa- her her sail. At night she her would pace sail her sail and her satchet. Yeah, she would pace her cell, screaming, moaning, crying. Well, don't kill people. Well, I think she might not be well. She did see her daughter and her granddaughter. So Ernestine came to visit mm-hmm. her. Her mother had to come and get her. Obviously, Ernestine remembers seeing her at the wow. at the jail cell. That's and wild. saying goodbye to her. And she said all her grandmother was worried about was that Ernest, did Ernestine have warm winter clothes mm. for come for the cold season coming up? So that's what's so interesting to me. It's so easy for us to just mark a person as terrible and they have to be After terrible. They kill but 17 people. Well, even no, like that's why these people like this can go on for so long, I'm saying. Right, right. Because you see good, there are good Jive. sides. You see, yeah, you see these good sides of people and you think, well, that can't be true. She just did something nice. It's hard for our brains to understand that you can do terrible things and good things in the same yeah. day, right? I think that's a problem generally. Like nothing yeah. is black and white. Everything's on a scale. Yeah. Like a slider. Yeah. It's hard for us to recognize, to, to like it's, it would have been hard for Ernestine, I'm sure, to try to reconcile the woman she knew, which was the nice one, with the woman that was presented in trial in news, and, it, and, yeah. and just like it would have been for neighbors if oh she baked me a bunch of biscuits that's a really nice thing to do you have this usual crowd like you do for all these trials reporters Ugh, people yep. lining up to watch papers ready to go the first thing they're of course commenting on is that her beauty has faded i mean she's in her 50s and she's in prison i like so like, give it a rest a life i know like Ugh, i'm so sick of that and that her eyes are dead. Well, she's probably not feeling great, guys. I don't mean <laughs> Lordy. Also, she's murdered a lot of people. I feel like that drains your soul. <sighs> yeah. So the trial starts. 
the Stufelders who had lost the three children under Bertha's care, they testify first and they say that Bertha had a reputation as helping and they, honest to God, never suspected anything. A neighbor testifies that Ed, the last man who died, was actually given the lemonade from his mother, not from Bertha, and that his mother was sitting by his bedside all day. Then Ed's widow takes a stand, Ladelphia is her name, Oh. And Ed was an alcoholic, so much so that he used to be a butcher in town. They'd had to close that. He He's drinking away all the money. Jeez. So they'd been living separate lives. She remembers that Bertha took care of Ed and then stated something along the lines of, you'd be a heap better off now. <gasps> Aqua Tavana. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a, is she doing this because she thinks it will be better for people? But not. They, you can't apply that to all cases because like... Five of them are kids. So then day two of the trial starts. So Ed's mom, Mary, takes the stand, and she is adamant that she did not give her son that lemonade. lemonade. She absolutely did not. She said she got there to take care of Ed and asked him how he was feeling, and he said he had a ham sandwich and he had a glass of lemonade. After the lemonade, he did not feel well. Pharmacist took the stand. He says that Bertha bought an ounce of arsenic on the day that Ed died. I mean, we know arsenic happens, so... Doctor testified that arsenic was found in Ed's organs. Now, the defense tries to get the confession thrown out, saying that it wasn't actually a confession. She wasn't saying, I gave them arsenic to kill them. She was saying, yes, I gave them arsenic to help them. Right. Right? So that's what they're trying to do. The chief also testified. He said he wrote the confession based off their conversation. He even admitted that Bertha took, admitted she took the arsenic for her own heart, heart rate, but also to look younger. Apparently, it was a beauty treatment. There's no way. No, well, yeah, no, it was. I looked it up. It's, I mean, we, people use Botox now. People would use Botox. it. It would make their complexion, uh, it would make their, like, a peaches and cream complexion. It's poison, though. It's <laughs> you nuts. keep slipping into your New Zealand accent. It's poison, It's, it's, eh? it's poison. Right. It was, it was used as a, a skin treatment. Back in the day. So that is legitimate. So Sheriff Gorg, who's the one who took care of her, the only one she would talk to, he said that he believed Bertha thought that the arsenic was helping and she did not have any harmful intentions. None of the other lawmen agree with him and they say, no, that's not true. Hmm. And then I mentioned it also comes out later via the paper, not through the trial, that Dr. Hemker actually also gave arsenic and strychnine to his patients, but he had held off because of his suspicions. Oh. Now, on November 21st, the confession is deemed admissible, which is devastating to Bertha's case. And so the defense switches tactics and they enter a plea of insanity. Huh. That doesn't look good. It's worth noting that no psychiatrist ever spoke to Bertha. They decided on her diagnosis just based off reading the current trial transcripts. Feels like that's a half-assed job. And then they pull out all the witnesses they can to say that she was nervous and excitable. So Gene is up there testifying for his wife. He says she's been depressed. She's been battling insomnia ever since she entered menopause, which I'm sure he didn't use that word. I don't know. Mm -hmm. know. The change. I don't know what it was called. But (laughs) he's saying she's changed since then. And all of the psychiatrists agree that Bertha has dementia precox, which is essentially schizophrenia. Oh. And then the all-male jury deliberated for three hours and came back with the verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity, and she was sentenced to life in the state hospital for the criminally insane. Whoa. The reason they switched gears is because if she was found guilty, she would have been executed. Got it. It would have been death by hanging. So they switched gears, but nobody ever really assessed her. Nobody ever actually talked to her. I don't understand that. I don't either because like you're going doing doing this just go all the way and have an interview. <laughs> I know. Because why why this is important is because understanding people like Bertha allows us to help people in the future or for other people to notice it sooner, right? Right. Right. Like the best way to see the future is to understand the past. And so understanding truly Wise what this ways. woman's Diagno- thank you. What this woman's diagnosis is would be helpful to other people down the road. Now, she enters the you know hospital. She's first assessed by Dr. Hank in February of 1929. He could find no apparent diagnosis. She was coherent, mm. nothing unusual about her affect, nothing unusual about her memory. The following month, 
doctors continued to observe Bertha. And they say she was showing signs of psychosis and paranoia, but there are verbatim transcripts from these interviews, and one of the doctors doesn't agree with the others because Bertha said people were mad at her. That's why she was accused of these crimes, that her and a neighbor had gotten into a fight, which I think they grabbed onto as paranoia, but she only says she got into a fight with one neighbor. She got into a fight with one neighbor that everybody else treated her well enough that she got into How one fight with paranoia? this one. That's what I'm saying. With this one neighbor and everybody else treated her well enough. The staff here was treating her well enough and she did not hear voices, but she didn't, and she did not belong there. That's what she says. She also says that Dr. Hemker was a dope and a whiskey fiend <laughs> and s- suggested that he was giving the wrong meds and that he was drunk when he was seeing patients. That never Whoa. came out in the trial. I mean, Yikes. is that a possibility? I mean, it's a possibility, but I mean, she's got all the reason to slander and make up stuff too, though. Sure. December 26, 1929, there's a note in her file, continues to be a good worker and a nice, quiet patient. So she worked in the beauty salon and in the kitchen. Jean is visiting her regularly, even though it takes him hours to get to where she is. And in mm. later years, much later, they would actually let her leave for the weekend to go home with Jean. That's and then wild. He'd, he'd bring her back. Wait, so she's so she's at a hos- psych- psychiatric hospital, but she's not in like a a cell. No, she can move. Like she, okay. it's more like a prison. I mean, she has a job, and because I mean, being in a in a place like that can also just damage your mental health, anyways. For sure. So her great granddaughter, who wrote the book, yeah, she said you could make an argument for so many different theories. You could make an argument that she's a ser- serial killer, that she meant to kill these people, and that that's was her goal, and she did it. You could. Look into Dr. Hemker a little more. Was she a scapegoat for a doctor who was dealing with addiction and giving patients the wrong medicine or Hmm. doing something wrong and he blamed it on her? Was she naive enough to think that arsenic would actually help and thought she was helping patients? Those are all things she says you could you could look at all those. What she believes is that she believes without a doubt that she absolutely killed her first husband, Henry. Hmm. She believes, forget the others for a minute, she believes Bertha killed her first husband. And what's interesting is in the trial, Jean took the stand and the newspapers noted that that is the only moment in the trial where Bertha showed any emotion. She basically sat there stone-faced through the whole thing. But when Jean took the stand, she let emotion take over her face. Now they described it as almost sadness or tears or like a connection to Jean. Mm -hmm. But what her great-granddaughter poses is Maybe it was fear. Maybe Jean knew or was involved with the death of her first husband. And Bertha was afraid that he was going to testify against her in that moment. Because Jean would Mm. have to have known or been suspicious because he very conveniently died as they were having their affair. So that's her theory on that. But then she also thinks... She thinks, did they, did she give them arsenic? Yes. She even says that she gave them arsenic. Nobody's denying that fact. She doesn't believe that she gave them arsenic with the intent to kill them, but she does believe she gave them arsenic with the intent to make them sick, which is hard to, it's hard to draw that distinction, but I think it's an important one because it's a different diagnosis. She doesn't probably have schizophrenia, but she probably had something like Munchausen's by proxy because- And why this is interesting is she said as she was researching this, she's actually talking to people who are technically her family members, right? Because it's like generations in this small town. And she said stories had been passed down from Bertha's siblings that you don't eat what Bertha brings to the potluck. Uh, Okay. Right? So people, like this was obviously some sort of sickness or compulsion that Bertha had for whatever reason. And, but they didn't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to deal with this mental illness. They don't know how to say something. They don't know how to get her help. So it's mm-hmm. like, you just don't say anything. So is she, was she doing this to get them sick and she just was not great at it? Was she making them sick to take care of them? Were they already sick and then she was giving it to them? Was she trying to give them arsenic to put them out of their misery for because she thought they wouldn't survive or she thought their family would be better off like in the case of what she said mm-hmm. to Ed's widow. I don't know, but it puts a different spin on it. It's feel it. She feels different to me than Jolly Jane. Let's just say that. 
I guess. Like, the, yeah, it, it is different. Like, Jolly Jane had, I mean, it was more clear cut. But, Jolly Jane truly enjoyed it. Yeah. But the, the, what I'm getting stuck on is how many of them there are. So it's like, oh, I think this will make them better. Oh, I think this will make them better. 16 more times. Like, she, she's but, not an idiot. But they, those are just, they literally just went back. That's the other thing that the um, the author brought up, which I think is a good point. How many people did Bertha take care of? Because if Bertha only took care of 30 people, then this doesn't look real yeah. good. If Bertha took care of 500 people, then you have to imagine that only seven, 17 people dying makes sense and for that time. And you would expect those numbers. And maybe she only gave arsenic to those last three victims. I mean, I don't. I'm just throwing out alternative theories. I don't know what I believe. Other people paint Bertha as just very, very obsessed with death, very morbid, very controlling, and purposely giving this to watch them die. That's how other people paint the picture. Gross. You know, I don't know which one is true. I don't know if she was giving them arsenic to make them sick, and then she would swoop in and hopefully save them and be the hero. <sighs> It's too bad that she didn't get better mental health care because it would be really fascinating to know what is causing this. Because right, if like, I'm having a potluck and everybody's like, don't eat so-and-so's biscuits because <laughs> they've got arsenic in them, I'm probably going to say something nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because that's uh, – there are, there are some services available. But God, you just kind of keep everything quiet. She burned down a school for God's sakes. Yeah. I think she I think she was definitely poisoning these people and I don't know that she necessarily cared if they died or they lived. Hmm. That's a fair theory. She would plan a lot of the funerals as well. Okay, that's too far. But it's really interesting to hear about it from her great-granddaughter's point of view because, you know, it's something that her great-granddaughter had had to hear about and had to deal with her own guilt and her you know especially her mother who's the granddaughter yeah. had, they had to deal with the shame and the guilt of it it's it's and she's meeting people she's meeting people who are victims of her grandmother or great grandmother's actions so she's Ooh. meeting relatives of you know the victims it's awkward yeah and enough time had passed that it was actually pretty healing conversations oh, and that's good they will talk about it because a lot of them were also related to her because it's such a small town. You know how that is. They're yeah. like distant cousins. Bertha passed away from a stroke August 20th, 1951. Jean had her buried back in Morse Mill, but there is no headstone. Originally, it was thought that he didn't get a headstone because of her past, but in writing the book, her great-granddaughter found out that there was an unpaid balance and she believes Jean died before he could pay the entire balance. He paid for half of it, so there's... no. Oh. There's like the start of one, and then he died before the rest of the balance could be paid. And he, because he does, she doesn't believe that Gene would not put a headstone up. He believed she was wow. innocent until the day he died. Why? I don't know. I know. I don't or know. he just loved her, even though she was a murderer. Maybe. But then, like, you know I what? I feel like I, Chris would love me, even if I was a murderer. Really? Even if he yeah. killed his own family? I mean, that may be a little bit more complicated. <laughs> We'll, be, we'll be need to talk that one out a little bit. <laughs> I, that, what I find interesting about her, though, is she did not. There were certain people that seemed to be off limits for Bertha. She did not hurt her granddaughter. She did not hurt her own children. Her mother-in-law, though. Those aren't her people. She did not hurt Jean. There were people <sighs> that she did not hurt. Her mother, I don't think she liked her mother-in-law. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. See you later, Ma. <laughs> You're the one who said it was okay 40 minutes ago. <laughs> I didn't say it was okay. I said it was less you go, crazy. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> but I'm, that's unusual. Like, Jolly Jane just killed everybody. She's killing her yes, sister who yes, loves her. Yeah, that's true. She's, I mean, she's, and Marianne Cotton killed how many of her own children? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, just all of them. This is This is another interesting part of it. Like, what's different about Bertha where she draws a line in the sand and says, I love these people and I will not hurt them? I mean, get, getting her good graces, am I right? Yeah, you get survivor's guilt from that, being the people who survive yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. But I don't know. It seems likely that she 
was Ooh. killing people left and right. But it is interesting to think about those conspiracy theories. What if Dr. Hemker was setting her up this whole time? Oh, man. Gosh, that's wild. It's crazy that you don't hear about these. I know you don't hear about them. They don't, they just kind of sweep it under the rug. That's what I'm saying. It'd be fascinating if somebody had actually studied her so that we could have that information and understand it a little bit better. Oh my God. What? Your chair, you were slowly moving your chair a little bit and I thought somebody yeah. was creeping up. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. And I was going to watch you get murdered and I was You were going to tell me? Well, I was going to tell you, but I didn't want to get you too alarmed. I wanted to check it out first. Yeah. Why don't you assess the situation um, and let me <laughs> let me waste those precious seconds of survival time. <laughs> well, would you rather die instantly not knowing, like, real quick? Oh, I haven't even – or, or me surviving is off the table. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> I like how you instantly went to, well, it'll be a painless death. I'll just let this play out. <laughs> I mean, they have more of an advantage if you don't see it coming. So you wanted them to have more of an advantage. Is, no, again, I, wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to make sure. I thought it was probably not an attacker because I didn't see anybody come through the door. Anyways. Anyway, I, I'm going to just give a quick look behind me real quick. <laughs> No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> well, I recommend reading the book, The Tainted Leg Legacy of Bertha Gifford, a memoir by S.K. Murphy. She's an excellent writer. She's a, actually a writer. So when people found out this was her history, they said, well, obviously you're writing this book, right? And it took her a minute to get there, but it's it's actually a really well-written, really good book. Yeah, it's wild. And it's just fascinating. You got to remember that there, there, everybody has good, everybody has evil in them. And mm -hmm. you have to just remember what you want to remember. And you have to listen to your gut when you're in those situations. Fight, it, fight against the evil inside. Squash it up and put it in a little box and throw away the key. Wow, a therapist would have a field day with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> what? We all have it both inside of us. Make sure one doesn't get out. Make sure you completely repress all of your urges. <laughs> they won't come back. They won't come back to haunt you. <laughs> Lock them up. All of your emotions now. Yes. All right. Do you have any last words for us, ma'am? Don't use arsenic as face cream. I don't believe in it. I think they would ingest it. That makes it worse. I'm I'm out. No more arsenic. All these women kill with arsenic. No, I'm saying don't eat, don't ingest anything. Don't ingest it. I think, it. pretty sure that's stopped. I'm pretty sure we're good now. Good job, guys. Yeah. And I mean, it's just wild to think about what people thought were okay. But I'm just waiting. Like, I think I we've discussed before. What is, what are we doing right now? Like, you know, leeches were a thing. Like, chemo is yeah, like chemo. actually killing stuff. I mean, but it also saves people. It's like, what, what's actually. We'll see in 50 years if we're alive. I mean, there are things that we do today that are, are ridiculous and we just don't know it yet. I know. That's why I can't wait to – I just can't wait to read all the history books of when we're alive. So we'll see if we'll make it. <laughs> are, you peg, are you penciling this in for when you're 80? Yeah. <laughs> I Yeah, I am. I, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> if we make it. Well, I'm, I almost died just now and you didn't care <laughs> at all. You I like, did. You're like, I hope it's painless. I'm going to keep quiet so it's instant and you don't get <laughs> caught in the side of the head. It's been nice knowing you. Oh, make it All quick. right. Well, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Instagram at... Tea Time Crime. <laughs> you can email us at... Tea Time Crimes at gmail.com. And who should listen? Oh, man. Let's get your farmers, your granddaughters, your great-granddaughters. Let's leave the doctors out of this one and the nurses. Um, but maybe some of your neighbors might like it, too. So share it around. I love a good nurse and a good yeah. doctor. Yeah, but they're not the heroes of this story. We'll just say it that way. <laughs> the nurses won't stray in this story. But <laughs> that is not a fair representation of most nurses. Most no, nurses are incredible. Not. True I have dad. another cousin who's a nurse. Wow. That's Actually, a lot of family. special listener's sister is a nurse. Oh. So, yeah. Now, uh, you mean special listener junior sister? No. Oh. No. 
I mean, original special listeners. Got sister it. Sister is a nurse, so thank you. And thank you to our special listener, Junior. And we plan to be back next week, God willing, and I stay safe. And our first <laughs> December episode. I don't plan on doing anything themed. True crime I do. and Christmas don't go together. Oh, you do, yeah. Teas, teas and Christmas. Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for listening, and we'll be back next week. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> You're such a creeper <laughs> these days. <laughs>